I'm JJ Walsh, your host in Hiroshima, Japan. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Lee Shanji in Wakayama. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks, JJ. It's so wonderful to meet virtually. We met at the Minka Summit. That's right. And、uh, you were talking about community development and really interesting insights. And then we sat together for the keynote dinner and、uh, chatted a little bit more. And I am just astounded and impressed with the amount of amazing projects you are doing there. Can you tell us a little bit of your backstory? How did you end up in Japan? How did you end up in this beautiful area of the Kumano Mountains? I came to Japan 10 years ago, so I'm Singaporean. I、uh, came here and、uh, it was Tokyo at first. I studied at Waseda University.、Uh, it was a political science program, so it was fun.、Uh, I studied some very dark things.、Uh, then I, I joined the internet company for a year.、Uh, I was really bored in Tokyo because it was a desk job and、uh, I used to be a documentary、um, film producer. So, I wanted something that I can do outside, like outdoors, and it was like tour guiding. So, I set up a tour,、uh, tour guiding company with a friend from Tokyo, and、uh, it, we moved to Kyoto. So, for four years, we ran top rated tours in Kyoto.、Uh, this one called the Hidden Water Cycling Tour. So, we take people to the water, the wells, and tell people stories.、Uh, and another one at Fushimi Nari, which is the really famous place with the Tori Gates. And、uh, that went on for、uh, four years. So, we had like almost a thousand people attend.、Uh, so, those were tours in Kyoto. And once COVID hit, of course, the borders were shut. We couldn't do anything、uh, with、uh, people coming in live. So, we have every, had everything move online. And at first, it was a flower tour of the palace with my dog, Mori.、Uh, and she likes hunting for flowers. We moved online. And I was thinking, why don't I just film, film something about Fushimi Inari and do it online too? So, meditation classes online. And then afterwards,、uh, people like Microsoft,、uh, Facebook, Amazon, all, the, all those people sign up for、um, experiences for their, for their colleagues. And、uh, I've been doing that ever since. So, yeah, thanks, thanks for the website. That's Craft Tabby, my website.、Uh, so, I do various tours online now. And those two that you're scrolling now with, with、uh, the, the original tours that we had. So,、uh, I moved here in, into Wakayama in April last year. Uh, so, I work at my computer right here most of the time, but sometimes it's outside. Live tour of、uh, it's called Life in Nature. So, I go outside and talk about plants.、Uh, we have trivia questions about、uh, Japanese architecture, and all, the, all that's done for corporates. So,、uh, that's what I'm up to right now. The next thing, though, is to set up a cafe uh, selling uh, vegetables and fruits uh, in. Uh, that, that's from the farm, my farm.、Uh, and it's going to be at a cafe, so tea. And it doesn't really match, but curry also. That's great.、Um, I was watching your video. We're going to talk about all your tea cultivation,、uh, uh, finding, finding some of the old trees around your area.、Yeah. And then in one of your videos, you show this、uh, picture、mm -hmm. and you say, This is your cafe. Is that right? Uh, it's behind, <laughs> behind the very nice、uh, Sasanka tree. So、uh, it has a very leaky roof. And、uh, we have had funding from the, Kyoto, the Tokyo government、uh, to do the flooring, but not the roof. So that'll be next week, starting from next week. We have to put in a septic tank,、uh, put in a kitchen,、uh, and lots of construction work is going to happen again next week. It seems like life here is all about construction. Wow. That's amazing. But that photo was from when, when I first started. I think that was a year ago. Yeah,、uh, right、that was now, one year ago.、Uh, right、and、now, you, the grass is happening. You say in May 2022, the cafe is going to be open. Right.、Uh, not、But、quite it's now yet. It's but... till, till around、uh, maybe late July.、Uh, oh, okay. So、okay. summertime then. Perfect.、Yeah. Perfect.、Um, now, tell us a little bit about the house you're in now because、right. I think I saw、um, the before after video. 
All right. Is this the older house that yes, you remodeled this is the older for house yourself? On the property, yes. So I'm renting this house. Uh, there are two houses, well, actually three houses on the property. Uh, one that's too broken down. It's very quite far down. It's broken down. We can't do anything with it. Too many termites. Uh, the second house is that, that you showed just now is hidden behind the tree. Uh, that's uh, going to be a cafe where people can sit down and enjoy tea. It's a nice quiet area with some sofas. And this is the house, the third house on the property. So it's 120 years old. Uh, it was built uh, by a family working in the mountains. So uh, almost everyone in Ryujin Mura in the past worked, on for it worked in forestry, so in the trees. And therefore, uh, I'm not sure, well, it's very hard to see from, from the video, but this here, this pillar is actually Sakura. And it extends up all the way about two stories high because it's Kayabuki, so a attached roof. And can you imagine how large a sakura tree this had to be to reach two, two and a half stories, actually? Uh, so about how many meters? Seven, eight meters at least. At least. And uh, that's all sakura, all the pillars. So that's the nice thing about living in this house. And uh, it's uh, it didn't used to be like this. If you watch the before and after video, uh, you have seen that this area was so badly infested with termite. Well, but I didn't see any termites, but all the wood was uh, damaged. You can see termite damage. The carpenters who worked with me on this house, I was helping them with the removal of stuff, and they were doing the actual work. Uh, they said that the house had, had sunk by about two inches. So they jacked the whole house up, and uh, we replaced the flooring for the entire house. I've got um, some screenshots from your video. Is this the house here? All uh, right, yeah, yeah, that's the house here. So before and after, yeah, and you right see now, the big garden in front, right? Yeah, that that's actually just part of the garden. So uh, the whole property is about one acre, uh, and therefore there's a lot of grass to be cut. And what you're seeing there is just uh, when I started doing a bit of farming. Right now, if you see, uh, I think this was around this time last year, and if you look at the garden now, it has lots of flowers. So I'm pretty proud of it. And if you come, uh, like uh, maybe 50 different flowers blooming at the same time in spring. Nice. It looks like you're doing a lot of uh, farming from the other videos I saw. I'd say uh, gardening. This... I wouldn't say farming because I'm not oh, okay. selling yeah, for, yeah. for profit. So <laughs> there are lots of farmers in Japan. I'm not one of them. I'm a gardener. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I think you just brought up a picture of the, the floors. Uh -huh. uh, so that's... No, nori san's back the the carpenter is nori san uh, mr no uh, uh, takimoto nori so this is back and uh, i think he's preparing the jacking uh the jack for the house there and where he is is uh, right there this area so you can see the new floors they're now in uh you've got so much tatami uh, yeah, it's all uh, the main room. So uh, it's a traditional Tanoji house. Tanoji means uh, it has four rooms plus one irori space and the kitchen. So everything except the doma. The doma is the, the entry uh, entrance foyer area. Uh, that's just concrete. But everything else except the kitchen is tatami. Uh, so it's, um, it's uh, very nice to step on, but a lot of maintenance. You have to sweep, you have to vacuum. Uh, and what else? For the first year, uh, tatami always has a bit of mold. It was a lot of spraying of vinegar, wiping them down. But this year, this time, this time last year, it was quite a bit moldy. The mold was coming in. This year, nothing at all. So I guess it's right. Uh, people, what people say is right. The first year of tatami owning is the, the the most terrible. Afterwards, it's just very nice and smooth and comfortable. Nice. I like that recipe. What was it? Vinegar? Vinegar. So uh, what people do is have uh, white vinegar. Uh, well, at least rice vinegar, but without sugar added. So sometimes vinegar in Japan has uh, is sushi vinegar, which comes with sugar. If you spray the sushi vinegar on your floor, you'll have ends all over. So make sure you use uh, vinegar. And uh, what, I, what I do is 50% uh, alcohol, uh, the, the sterilizing alcohol, I think. I use a 75% uh, alcohol uh, mix uh, and 50% of it will be vinegar, 50% alcohol. Uh, so that that does get rid of the, the mold. Wow, interesting. Yeah. The and first year, definitely uh, mold because uh, if you don't want them to spray, uh, some tatami actually, they, they spray some uh, mold in inhibitors, those those chemicals. Uh, I didn't want that. I told the tatami maker I want, as want something as natural as possible. He said, well, the first year you have mold. I said, yeah, why not? It's okay. Uh, and this year, everything's fine. 
So even though you're renting, it looks like you invested a fair amount of money in the remodel. But right. the kitchen looks like kitchen one area seen. you didn't have to change too much, right? Mm, because that will be renovated later this year. So uh, I am planning to make this this into a, a Airbnb. So I'm going to stay here and host people in the same house. And uh, to, uh, well, the kitchen has, uh, has quite a bit of air coming through the floorboard. So <laughs> it does need some renovations. Uh, and so far, I think, spend close to what uh 190 months so about between almost 19 20 000 us dollars on the house here uh the thing is that the rent is really low so i worked out i did my sums and it seems that if i continued living in kyoto uh, and i rented my old place in kyoto I have uh well it'd be like six years of rent in kyoto would pay for the renovations for this house and uh i thought yeah well why not? After, after six years it will break even and uh it'll be cheaper from then on like month wise so uh yeah so a lot of money money at the start it wasn't cheap but uh right now costs are coming down because all the major works are done your landlord must be happy oh, with he's, all the he's work overjoyed he's so <laughs> he's very very happy he said when he first came he said uh do anything you want with the house uh, I'm, I'm okay you don't have to ask for permission for anything and uh and the the thing is in the village here um people do trust each other and I have a friend who is living in a village. He, he was like, uh, well, if you if you renovate the house, it's still it's quite unlikely that they'll take back the house and rent it out to someone else. Uh, and also, very few people, few very, very few people want to move all the way into rural Wakayama to to live in a kominka. So uh, unlikely that this house will be taken back by the landlord. That's a possibility, but I hope to be able to buy the house from him, uh, like in a few years' time. Uh, he says he'll think about selling it uh, when his uh, uh, relatives are, are okay with it. So let's see. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that you talked about uh, in the community development, right? right? About spending time there and getting the local trust. And then you're offered better properties, but you also have a better relationship. And then uh, because they trust you, uh, you have more opportunities to do the kinds of things you want to do, right? Right. So actually, I, I haven't bought this house, but my friends, two friends have bought houses here. So about six minutes up, there's one house that's a Kayabuki clad house. It's a thatched house. Uh, and that's hundred year, over 100 years old. Uh, and uh, another house that's about 30 years old, very nice on a, uh, on a high spot. You can, you can see the mountains all around. Uh, another friend just bought that in March. I helped him with the purchase and another friend is going to buy the house uh slightly further up from this house so uh three houses for sale and all of them were friendship price so uh the the second house for the uh, first house for example um the carpenters helped me to to buy it and uh it was uh it was ten thousand dollars so I, it's on youtube and the second house was selling for i think about uh, fifty thousand US dollars, fifty five thousand US dollars. Um, but when the owner heard that I was one who who, who was introducing a friend, um, they said, well, twenty thousand. Uh, they half like more than half the price. So the same for the house next door. Uh, it was selling for sixty thousand, and because my neighbors know me, now it's going for twenty. Hmm. So, uh, know your neighbors. Uh, know thy neighbors. And uh, and help like you've been helping. Um, with them like cutting grass and doing stuff like that so you're you're mm. also showing that the you're in cutting grass is for no? just my property oh, my just property you? used to okay. be full of kaya, kaya which is uh, suzuki which is the uh, pampas grass so if you live next to a uh, an abandoned field you wouldn't feel good so neighbors saw me cutting grass and that started conversations now now it's not about grass they give me things like strawberries uh things like dumplings uh their hamburger their hamburgers when you make them uh so it's more about food exchange now uh stuff that i have my garden i exchange it with them uh and uh we get interesting food all the time yeah but even cutting your own grass is something yeah. the neighbors always yeah. appreciate. Yeah, right? yeah, they're like, oh, you cut your grass. That's so nice. They're, well, the Japanese word for uh, a field, a very 
nicely trimmed feel is kide. Kide means beautiful, right? Which isn't the best thing because uh, I, I I'm practicing something called natural farming where you don't you try not to uh well not try not you do not use pesticides you do not till the land and uh, if you cut grass too short that means that the butterflies the bees don't have flowers to feed on so I'm uh what I do is I allow the grass to uh, grow up to about a foot or two and that's quite high for the standards of most people here but it's full of flowers and the main thing is uh, make sure the, the miscanthus grass doesn't grow the pumpus grass because th those grow about grow, grow to about two meters taller than a human being so if you had those nearby your house uh, lots of horse flies lots of mosquitoes people don't like that so that's the main thing that people don't want and once you get rid of th that then you're free to decide how tall your grass should grow. Oh, awesome. And speaking of bees, uh, you have also started beehives, right? Unfortunately, uh, they're empty. The beehives, the seven beehives I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, oh, that's... Uh, uh, that's, <laughs> that's me cutting grass. So that's a beehive, yes. And the beehives, uh, I've uh, put on the pheromone thing, the white little thing that you see, the disc, it's a uh, pheromone for bees. But uh, it seems like bees are not uh, coming to this area now. Um, maybe because there are not enough flowers, the population is getting older. So um, people are farming less. These are, uh, yeah, they can see the little bee on the far right uh, feeding on this uh, rapeseed. So very few people are gardening now, which means the bees have less food. And I think that's affecting the population here. So um, ironically, I think there are more bees. Uh, well, it's easier to keep bees in Kyoto City. Uh, I think there are a few very successful rooftop bee projects, uh, but harder to keep bees here in the, the mountainside. So uh, well, well, let's hopefully, see. Yeah, hopefully the more that you're doing natural farming without pesticides, the more the bees yes. might come back. Yeah. yeah, so I was speaking to my neighbors who were using Roundup. Roundup is a pesticide uh, that's uh, very toxic. And uh, I was telling them about the the bees going away and they're like, oh, yeah. And I was saying, oh, the most important thing is I was saying that if you don't use Roundup, uh, I'll, I'll take the grass that you cut and put them on my compost heap. But if you use Roundup, I can't use your grass. I can't take your grass away. And they're like, okay, this year we are stopping. <laughs> so that's the, that's the nice thing that's about a having really a compost. good incentive. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. right now, my neighbors, whenever they cut grass, they, they, well, somehow Japanese people don't like to remove the grass from the field. It's actually very good mulch. Uh, they, they want to put it somewhere or burn it. So like, uh, over here, I'll be moving away because this is in front of my my friend's house and uh, it's right in front of the Engawa. So I'll be removing that and it goes into my compost heap. Let's talk about your compost because you built a brand new compost heap. How's that going? Uh, it's actually from wood that is about 30, 40 years old from the cafe house. So I reused those, uh, I think they were paneling for the, the walls and they were all quite nice wood. So I uh, repurposed them into two bays, uh, two, two mulching, well, no, two, two compost heaps. So it's working. Uh, the, the stuff that I put in, uh, that's me in, I think a few months ago. Uh, now the compost heaps are kind of full. Uh, and uh, the carpenter Nori San gives me yeah wood chips. So, <laughs> so <laughs> you're, you're doing the slides really well. So uh, those are wood chips that the carp carpenter is giving me, and uh, I've been adding them on. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's he's 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 quite kind of busy. So uh, I'm laying sawdust everywhere now <laughs> to keep the weeds down. That's a really good technique, though. Um, and you've got oh. a big area. And one thing though, uh, some people might be like, oh, uh, isn't that toxic? Because sometimes wood is treated. Uh, over here in the village, we try not to, to chemi chemically treat or heat treat the wood. It's all sun-dried. So uh, if you're using wood chips as mulch, make sure they're not uh, chemically treated. They are sun-dried wood, then that's fine. Good tip. Um, have you found that even the weeds are able to break down? As well as uh, <laughs> it takes a long uh, time. is in the Kihanto, Ki Peninsula, which is one of the wettest areas in Japan. We get a lot of rain, so uh, the weeds here they grow very well. <laughs> Everything except what you want to plant grows very well. So, uh, the the sawdust does keep them down for a while, but you have to keep applying more sawdust. <laughs> yeah, and that's probably why you you were picking out so much plastic. Yes, from the yeah. previous gardener or the previous yes. farmer because yeah. that's what they use to keep the weeds down, right? Plastic mulch. So that's, that's really... Well, 
Um, for large commercial scale farming, uh, I, I, I don't agree with the use of plastic, but I can see why they're using plastic because the machines, they, uh, if you're using a machine to harvest, plant, uh, harvest things, you, you have to keep the field as, uh, as uniform as possible. So with my fields, it's natural farming. So everything grows together. We have daikon growing next to carrots, growing next to uh, tomatoes. So machines can't identify the, the things you, you're supposed to pick and they get well, everything gets stuck in the machine. So plastic mulch is late. You make sure that no weeds grow. But uh, what happens if you forget about the mulch is that the mulch gets a layer of uh, organic matter on top, some leaves. Uh, next year, the next year it breaks up because some bird packs at the, the plastic. And uh, for the fields right of my, in front of my house, it was days of just removing plastic. Uh, plus black plastic sheeting that have been left there since about 10 years ago. It all broke down. Uh, well, plastic doesn't break down. It it got torn. Uh, it went into tatters and I had to pick up all the pieces. So that was a, that was a nightmare. Uh, don't use plastic sheeting if you're going to forget about it. Yeah. At least uh, use the more uh, resilient type that you can reuse, which doesn't tear. Uh, that's that's what that's what the farmer here used. Oh, no. So it's very thick plastic, and it remains there. Oh. So, so it's uh. So it's well, not it's plastic. not a good solution. Yeah, sheeting oh. eventually. Well, it, it's just a sheet, so it does break uh, and and t and tear after a few years. So maybe it would work a lot better if you have like street uh straw or sure, sawdust. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, so it's what you can do right? is sawdust actually takes some some of the nitrogen from the ground for uh, temporarily. Uh, so if you are putting it on your vegetable beds, it it does uh, prevent the vegetables from growing well for the first year. Um, but if you put them in the alleyways, uh, it takes the nitrogen from the ground and the plants which need the nitrogen, they don't grow as well. So um, after after a while, the sawdust breaks down, the nitro nitrogen levels uh, uh, stabilize, and you can use the sawdust from your um, from the walkways. Uh, on you can just empty them on the vegetable beds, and new sawdust goes in, and the cycle continues. So you're making compost in your vegetable garden uh, on the the sidewalks. That's awesome. Uh, we have a great comment from Wendy. Oh, she Wendy, said yeah. So interesting how you're able to influence your neighbor's use of Roundup. Great that they appreciate you are there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So Wendy was the one who invited me for the community, uh, uh, the, the panel. So uh, yeah, Wendy wonderful. has been here also. And uh, Wendy came uh, with Rodrigo, a uh, partner. And uh, I, think, I think Rodrigo is a really good uh, um, uh, farmer uh in nagano also so i'm hoping to be able to go up to see how he is doing uh his gardening uh yeah. he's a, a serious farmer i'm, I'm just a little <laughs> just doing the basic gardening growing some beautiful vegetables and beans there's the beans, not many yes, yes. many farmers growing beans mm. uh plant-based protein is is not usually grown in japan so right I'm always so excited to get their beans yeah and beans are one thing that the wild boar and deer don't seem to want to eat uh, because, because they're in those cases, right? So, so uh, the deer and the monkeys, they, uh, they devoured my corn last year. So I'm not planting corn this year because corn is kind, kind of special. Uh, they ate the corn when it was really small and I don't have a fence. I don't like fences. So I've been planting stuff that the, the, the wild boar and monkeys don't eat. That happens to be okra, beans, uh, things like basil. That's what's out, yeah. that's what's out there. Yeah, because um, Chuck Kayser, who was also at the Minka Summit, uh -huh. um, he has big battles with the monkeys. They right. steal almost everything that he plants. It's right. really hard, right? Yeah, I've seen his Facebook post and he, he's he's selling he's selling his vegetables. I'll be using for my vegetables for the, the cafe, but if I run out of vegetables, I'll buy them from my neighbors. But uh, he's doing it to sell vegetables. So can you imagine when the monkeys rip out all the vegetables before you start to, before they even start to flower or anything? so <laughs> yeah it sounds like they mean it like they're just being jerks you know <laughs> uh well they just they, it's like a buffet so yeah. sometimes at a buffet they, they don't they don't have very good manners they want to taste and and if they're like oh this one's not so good but there's another one that we just go and what I found is that uh, I uh, so I, I was reading about this on Japanese forums. Uh, actually, the fur of dogs does prevent uh, monkeys from getting too interested in your plants. Maybe not 100%, but uh, because I have two dogs, um, I, I brush them and their fur goes into the field. Uh, I also allow them to pee on 
well, not on my plants, but around the fields. And that does seem to keep the monkeys away. The monkeys haven't been here this year. Uh, the deer, they come, but uh, they don't stay. And wild ball, we haven't had the wild ball so far this year. So fingers crossed. Maybe it's the fur. That is a good tip. Yeah. Cat, uh, doesn't seem right. to work. Uh... Cat fur <laughs> My four cats are of no use to farmers. <laughs> um, let's let's go through some of the other before and after. So this is one of the main rooms, right? Ah, yes. So that doesn't look too different in that video. It just looks slightly cleaner. Oh, the, the other the different the difference there is the lighting. It was all fluorescent lighting, white fluorescent lights. Uh, it looked terrible <laughs> when when I first came in. So I've switched them all over to warm lighting with uh, IKEA lights. So nice. uh, they're not traditional lights, but they look traditional enough. Uh, that's IKEA lighting, if you believe it. It's all controlled on a, uh, on a, on remote controls that are like uh, like this. Oh, uh, I just pressed something. Sorry, uh, it's supposed to be like yeah, this. So, okay, and uh, it looked like you you had treated the wood. What were you uh, uh, treated? On the yeah, wood? Uh, first it's washing the wood. You wash the wood. You spray it down. Uh, you wipe it down, and afterwards, I applied uh, a Eabura, which is, uh, I think, Eabura. It's, uh, is it rice bran oil? Well, it's an oil that carpenters apply on wood. Uh, it's natural oil. So I just applied them to the uh, the wood, and they, they started gleaming again. So very nice, deep colors. The, the shoji screens and the, uh, the doors, like uh, this, this doors here, are uh, all about 120 years old. So they start gleaming once you apply a bit of oil on them. Beautiful. So you didn't do any painting. You just treated the wood a little bit, make it a bit more dark? Uh, I had a new piece of sho uh, shoji screen. This is a new piece. I had to match it with all the other shoji screens, which were painted with kakishibu. Uh, so kakishibu is persimmon ex extract. And uh, I had to apply kakishibu to this one here otherwise it'll be white like the like this kamoi the, uh, the the rails so uh i did have to paint one one of them the new one but all all the rest they were just left alone um i have actually not applied oil on the shoji because traditionally you don't apply oil on soji, shoji but uh no uh, shoji yeah uh but on the fusuma yes uh and all the other doors yeah persimmon uh stain for the wood that's mm. an awesome idea now, one of the big projects you had was you actually put an irori in oh. the room, right. Right? right? That that looked like a really big project, right? Uh, it was actually quite a quick project. <laughs> so uh, the carpenters who helped me do it, uh, the older man was uh, Shizu Yang. We call him Shizu Yang. He... He's been a carpenter for, uh, he passed away last year, but before that he was working for 60 odd years as a carpenter. And he uh, he was thinking of a cheap way to make a, a irori for me. So if you could bring this slide up just now, if you can actually see uh, in the center is actually this stone thing. It's a, uh, it's a usu for pounding rice. So he used, reused that thing, uh, put clay on, along the sides. Uh, and in the middle, of course, is wood ash. And it's a very small irori. So it's more for like having tea, just a few fish. It's not a big traditional irori, but uh, this was quick. Uh, I think we did it in one and a half days. Yeah, it's one and a half days. That's to two of them, yeah. It looks beautiful. Um, but in, in the video that we'll put the link below, um, they took out all the tatami, was it? And right. then rebuilt it from the ground. Right, uh, because if you if you build to well, you have to make it low enough, uh, so that the heat uh gets retained there. And uh, in theory, the heat is supposed to spread through the house and all that. If you use a lot of wood, uh, if you keep having a fire on as in the past, but uh, because I have tatami around the irori, uh, there's a fire hazard, and I have to be very careful when I use it. So uh, after grilling some fish, I um I put all the charcoal. I normally use charcoal because the the uh, the flames don't the 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 wood doesn't crackle and fly on the tatami. Uh, I put them into the uh, this tata, uh, this charcoal uh, urn to make sure they don't burn. So there's also a fire extinguisher next uh, next to the irori, uh, and that's what happens when you have tatami next to the irori. Uh, so uh, my next irori will be wood floors, uh, not tatami. 
or or stone or something that's not stone floors not would be flammable. very luxurious yeah. <laughs> yeah oh that's beautiful and yesterday's talk with brett rasmus yeah, I've, I've watched it yeah and he he, he makes was charcoal charcoal yeah, yeah. i spoke so, to him about the because the village that i'm in ryujimura is next to the village that invented bean the uh the high quality uh, smokeless charcoal that doesn't burn without uh, that has uh, almost no carbon monoxide so those can be used indoors that's in, a, in, th in this village and when I start the cafe it'll be a, uh, a skewers uh, we are going to do yakitori yakibuta so I'm going to use the charcoal from uh, the charcoal maker in this village it's just about uh, 15 minutes down he makes ch the charcoal out of uh, oak uh, ubame oak and it smells really well, it smells faintly nice, kind of sweet. Uh, burns at very high heat, constant heat, no smoke. Wow. Yeah. Um, I think I heard you talking about your ideas for the cafe, um, that you really want to have as much local products as possible, using things just from your local area. You also are thinking about doing coconut rice. Is mm. that a Singaporean so, dish? Yeah, so I, am, I was thinking about what, what to serve and uh, i was thinking singaporean food would be interesting here because nobody serves in, like singaporean food in rural wakayama uh, so imagine having singaporean food from a metropolitan like, metropolitan area in a 120 year old farmhouse and I, I don't think you get it anywhere in the world so at first i was thinking of coconut rice uh, but coconut of course doesn't grow here in wakayama uh, we have palm trees but they are used for brooms not not for eating and uh, so we sa i've settled on making curry uh, Singapore style curry because it's not it's not going to be exactly Singaporean. The ingredients here are different, but Sing Singaporean style curry and uh, the skewers will be done sate sate style, which is Singaporean skewers. Uh, so that's possible here, um, and uh, it will not be coconut rice anymore. I'm afraid, like what I was planning to do in the videos, uh, but still Singaporean style curry and uh, skewers. Oh, are you going to have any vegan vegetarian options? Right, yes. Uh, so the vegetables here, are you? Oh, yeah, you're, you're pes uh, are you are pescatarian? No, vegan. No, vegan, right? The so, hardest, uh, the hardest we, one. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, vegetables here, they're great. Uh, we have shiitake, which are this big. So, oh. like shroom burgers, uh, maybe rice <gasps> yes. shroom burgers. Uh, yes. And uh, I, I'm going to start off uh, by getting my, my neighbors to provide some vegetables, but I think there will there'll not be enough vegetables to for this year and next year. They have to ramp up production. So some of it will come from the supermarket, of course, but uh, I, I'll, I've been, I'm trying to get everyone to do it uh, with no pesticides, and most of them are doing it without pesticides anyway. Uh, the next thing is to have them uh, not apply any chemical fertilizers. So uh, most of the locals here just use the fermented chicken uh, poop, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the, uh, the chicken manure, manure. Yes. yeah, the chicken manure, yes. and also the cow manure that's organic. So uh, I, I'm trying to get the, the neighbors to plant a bit more this year, carrots, uh, potatoes, stuff like that. I'm planting my own too. And uh, there will be ve vegan options, of course. Yay, fantastic. Now, one of the really exciting things is you also, I'm sure this is part of your vision for the cafe, but you are picking and roasting and making your own tea. Uh, tea, yes. Amazing. Yeah. Can you tell us about your process? Hmm. So uh, this, uh, well, I have, uh, I came here because of a friend who loves tea. His name is Shu. And uh, he, he used to be a sushi chef. He used to work as a food consultant, but he came back he came back to the village about 10 years ago. He's from the village. He was working in Tokyo, came back. Uh, we met over tea, actually. So uh, he was telling me about his tea. I came to Ryujimura to look at his tea plants. Came here another five more times and then fell in love with the village, with the waterfalls. Then I decided to move here. He helped me to find this place at the start. And uh, with Shu's help, uh, I started finding more tea plants around the house. Some of the tea plants are really obvious. They grow behind the house like this, for example, on the slope. Because when tea grows, if it grows up a meter, uh, about three or four feet, three feet, uh, the roots grow down at twice as deep. The tap roots are really deep. So if there's a land, landslide risk anywhere and you have a very steep wall, chances are that in, are, are that in Wakayama and Mie Prefecture, in the key Hanto region, you'll find tea grown on the slopes. And that's to hold the soil in. And therefore, this house, because it's built uh, nearby a slope, not a very steep slope, but a slope, you'll find the tea plants behind the house, in front uh, of the house in the Ishigaki, the stone wall, to hold the stone wall down. And in the forest, the mice have planted tea. <laughs> so traditionally, oh, that's 
that's not mouse planted. I think humans planted that tree. But uh, some of the trees are 100 years old. And the older the tea trees, uh, the nicer the tea tastes. They grow fewer leaves but because they're old. But the leaves, say they brew for five, six times without problems. Young tea plants from, let's say, if you go to a tea plant with tea plantation of like 20 old trees, which is standard in Japan, the tea will brew maybe nicely for two times. Third time, it loses any taste. But old tea trees, they taste really good. And that's what we have here. So that's me uh, plucking tea uh, from a tree that's a hundred year, at least hundred years old. Yeah, I can see the very large. Uh, well, it's not a trunk; the stems. That's amazing, and I love that you're uh, harvesting or able to harvest some of the tea in the shade as well. Yeah, so uh, ideally, tea should be shaded so that they don't taste. Uh, well, if you shade, if the tea is shaded, they taste more. Uh, they're not as hard. The leaves are not as hard, and uh, they they. The, the, the leaves mo grow more uniformly. If, if it's exposed to the sun, uh, which is most tea, planta tea plantations in Japan, actually the tea is not that great. So if you go to a tea plantation which has trees, tall trees above the tea trees and grass of all sorts, flowers of all sorts uh, below, like below the tea tree, then you have very, very good tea. So uh, I... It's not all the tea bushes here that have that condition. Like this one here is exposed with, to the sun. But uh, the ones in the lower part of the property, they are covered. So uh, that's there's a bit of a difference with the taste. The ones covered by trees taste better, of course. And you were making different varieties. So you said mm. here is white tea and you made udon tea and also green tea. Right. Um, can you just briefly explain the differences? Right, so uh, the the tea plant is Camellia sinensis. So once you have that plant, uh, you can use or, or Asamika. You have two different kinds, Asamika or Camellia sinensis, two uh, different tea plants. You can use either tea plant for white tea, for green tea, for black tea, depending on the the time you ferment the, the not ferment, but you oxidize the leaves for. So white tea is simply uh, the color of tea when you pour it out. It's very close to transparent because the tea is simply picked and sun-dried. Uh, in most cases, if you buy white tea commercially, it's going to be dried by machines. But here, traditionally, you do it... Um, well, not here, but anywhere in the world, it's supposed to be sun-dried. And that's white tea. Then you have green tea, which is picked, uh, rolled, and immediately fried, so no oxidization. There is... Uh, after that, you have oolong tea, which is uh, somewhat between green tea and black tea. Uh, oolong tea is uh, rolled, Oxidize for about half an hour to about one hour. You then fry it. Uh, or, well, I call it pan fry, but it's uh, roasting it. You roast it and afterwards you have to pick out all the stems. So that's what I was doing in the last picture. Picking out all the stems so that it's only leaves in the brew. That takes a lot of time. Uh, that's oolong tea. And then you have black tea, which is uh, the oxidization rate after you roll the tea. Uh, it's a couple of hours, six to ten, 10 hours because of the weather here, it's quite cold. So the tea oxidizes slowly. And when you when you brew the tea, it blues, brews quite dark. So it's called black tea. And then there's fermented tea, which is what I'm drinking right now. Um, hmm. Fermented tea is uh, oxidized slightly and you put in some spring water from where the tea plants are grown, so the spring nearby here, you, you spray the water on, on the tea, uh, you let it rest for a couple of hours, and afterwards you fry it again, you spray some more water, fry it again, spray some more water, that happens uh, three times, and you get fermented tea. So various teas from the same tea plant. Yeah. And the process is just incredible. Right. I think was the green tea when you were here in this picture right. picking out the different sizes because yes. before you roast it it should be the same size right roughly okay. the same size so if it's all if the fall uh, the tree of all leaves are all different size uh, i try to separate big leaves away from the small ones so that they they fry uniformly instead of uh, the small buds being over fried so that's very troublesome and most people well, if you drink tea, commercial tea, it will not be separated like this. Uh, if you have a very advanced machine that can separate the stems, yes. But uh, in Japan, if you drink green tea, sometimes it's very murky when you pour the liquid out. Uh, it's very, you can see all the dust uh, and it tastes like seaweed. That's an example of tea that's been over fertilized with nitrogen. And uh, it, it shouldn't taste bitter at all. If it tastes bitter tea, that's, that's simply not good tea. So I'm really happy with green tea because although it took about eight, ten hours from picking to making, 
and it was just 30 grams, just a bit of tea. Uh, the tea was so floral. When you smell tea, and if you if you smell it for the first time, it should smell only of flowers. And when you brew it, the first brew should be fr flowers, fruits, maybe some berries. Second brew, the same thing. Third brew should be no bitterness, very low, low astringency. And that's good tea. So I can only make a little bit of it. Uh, so that's going into my crowdfunding for my cafe very soon. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the tea from this year's uh, first first flush is going to the as a reward to people who contribute to the uh, the funding of the cafe. So that's something coming up soon. I haven't launched it, the crowdfunding thing. So stay tuned on YouTube. Yeah, that's amazing. And after so much effort, you must really appreciate drinking that tea, right? Yes, so I make sure I brew it many, many times. And that's why I picked the old trees. Uh, it doesn't make sense to brew just two times and the taste goes away. So make sure you get the best trees. Give it the best attention you can give because nobody else will give it that amount of attention. And when you brew it, it really, really tastes good. It smells like different kinds of flowers. So uh, yeah, tea, tea is magical. Everyone... Uh, everyone who makes tea makes sl something slightly different. So if I made tea and a friend made tea, the tea will taste different depending on whose hands uh, it was. That's amazing. Yeah. And just to reiterate what you just said, um, I also, that was really surprising to me at your video when you were saying the older trees mm. have the higher quality leaves so yes. that you can use it when you're finished processing and you're brewing it you can brew it five, four or five times, whereas the newer trees, you can only brew two or three two, times. Three times, yeah. Maybe even That's less. Sometimes if you buy supermarket tea, it's like one time. Uh, so, and, and the, flavor, the complex tea is different. Um, yeah. For young tea trees, you can taste maybe like five, six different kinds of flowers. But if you drink from older tea trees and you slowly, you breathe out, when you, after you drink the tea, you can smell like at least seven, eight, nine, ten different kinds of fruits and uh, vegetables in there. So uh, it's like magic from one just one plant. All these different smells. Sometimes it tastes like melon. Sometimes it's like uh, what else? Sometimes like black currant. You get things like uh, you can you can smell sunflower sometimes, uh, depending on where the tea was grown, how you make it, uh, and uh, how old is it. So you'll see very few old tea trees in plant tea plantations because uh, they don't produce as many leaves. Simply, they don't just they produce, they, basically they're old. So they stop producing as many leaves. I would say from an old tea tree uh, with about the same size as a young tea tree, maybe about 10%. So one-tenth of the amount of a very young tea tree. Uh, yeah, old trees, fewer leaves, but taste great. Really good. Yeah, beautiful. I can't wait to try it. And I imagine having something like that, which is a really great standout point. Um, there's not a lot of cafes you would visit in rural areas where you can taste the tea that they're growing themselves. And what a nice branding point as well. Although it is a lot of work, right? It is a lot of work. Uh, so in the future, there'll be workshops, tea workshops, <clears throat> when you make your own tea. <laughs> so the rolling and everything, you can do it yourself. Of course, I'll have my own teas also. But uh, I think the fun of drinking tea is also making the tea. Uh, some people prefer to just sip the tea. That's fine. They can come here to, to sip the tea. But uh, I think I've, I've never been to a place in Japan where uh, you have a cafe that's always open and uh, always serving tea that's from the area uh, so well there, there must be but very few I guess so uh, this would be uh, a selling point of the cafe here I guess yeah definitely um, I went to visit a place in Hiroshima called Tea Factory Gen and he took over some abandoned tea fields right. um, and he's growing his own tea and he's using very old like Showa era machines mm -hmm. to process the leaves because he likes the light touch. Mm. But if you're doing it by hand, of course, that's better. Um, but he doesn't sell it at his factory, at his plant. So you're right. That is really unique, really nice. No, I'm not against machines. Machines does, well, if you want to make 
uh, a certain quantity of tea, you do need to rely on machines. Otherwise, uh, after eight hours of work, you only have like a little bit of tea. It's not enough to serve like, maybe it's enough to serve like 10 different people and that's it. So uh, if you want to increase the quantity, you do have to rely on machines. But it, I guess it's the people operating the machines. Uh, if you don't know how the tea process works and you operate a machine, it could taste terrible or it, is, it could taste great. So it depends on the people making the tea. Yeah. Another really nice point from that video was that your neighbors are making their own tea, right? Right, right. Yeah, everyone here makes their own tea if they have the, uh, they have the, they have the time and energy. So, uh, the neighbors next door, oh, that's the, uh, that's the husband of the neighbor next door. Uh, so he is uh frying the tea, uh, in a metal wok that they have owned for the last well, his grandfather owned it. So it's been around for at least a hundred years, and those straw mats that you see hanging up there. Uh, those are no longer made. In the past, people have rice. They, um, they grew rice, and uh, the rice straw is woven into a straw mat. Nowadays, uh, if you want to buy this thing, it's called a goza. Nobody will sell it to you. That, that's used to roll the tea, uh, so that you don't have to use it by hand. You put it in a whole mat and you roll the tea. So, uh, yeah, that's that's what they use, and uh, uh, they they still make a bit of tea, uh, just enough for the year, for, wow. for just the family. That's awesome. Uh, another tea area that I visited on Shikoku Island uh, in Kamikatsu, they used to have a lot of tea industry, but people are getting older. Mm. And the tea, like you said before, is really on a steep slope. Mm. So it's kind of difficult as people get older to get up and keep maintaining those fields. Um, but they do a really beautiful fermented bancha. Mm, right there. but maybe similarly the old tools are becoming more rare so when there's less tea production even the tools become less used and then people use plastic but maybe the taste is not as good right right so uh well it's not that the tea the modern tea techniques are not as good it's that just that the people making the tea uh shouldn't be too impatient sometimes sometimes if you want a quantity you just just impatient the tea will taste terrible but if you use modern techniques and you really love the tea you you can identify the flavors you're uh paying attention to it then your tea will turn out good also so it's not a fact not a thing about using machinery or new techniques that are bad it's just that uh if if you're in pursuit of just quantity over the quality, then the tea will taste bad. Yeah. I I love the old big wooden barrels that they use, uh, which is also similar for shoyu and miso, that same big wooden barrel. Hmm. And there's not many wooden barrel makers anymore in Japan. So I think they have to import it from somewhere. But uh, once you start making tea using the old materials, maybe the makers will also start up again. That would be great. Well, uh, tea, tea doesn't that. actually require the, the barrel. So uh, that's if I'm making soy sauce. Uh, the thing is, I, I, I live here now. Uh, so there's actually, well, there's good walk I must show you. Uh, but uh, I'm still using shoyu from Kyoto. I used to live near the palace, the, the Kyoto Imperial Palace. There's a twice fermented uh, shoyu that's made in um uh wooden barrels that's uh sawai joyu and uh i have never been able to find another shoyu from anywhere in japan that's uh better than the one next to the palace so uh when i i'm serving my skewers the vegetables or the meat they'll be um i'll have the twice fermented shoyu from kyoto uh right here in the mountains so i hope that that will support the barrel makers because uh well it's just one shop making those show you but maybe if we use more of that show you uh, more barrels will be needed in the future i think so uh, we can help with creating demand as consumers right, right. Um, now so because you come from the tourist trade before in kyoto and once you start your cafe and guest house i'm sure you're going to use a lot of your great ideas from being a guide before I was really interested in wait, 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 where was it the bib, the bib shrine. Oh, okay, okay. There? There's a there's a shrine oh, for there it is. Uh, children. Uh, it's lost its mouth. Uh, it's a statue that's about four hundred years old, and uh, there are statues like this all over the village. I mean, everywhere in Japan we have Jizo San. This is a uh, Jizo San, and people from Osaka, from Wakayama City, they lift the bibs here. 
because they want to thank the uh, the Jizo for a safe child, a uh, safe delivery. Sometimes you get the thing that people wrap around their tummies when they are uh, they're pregnant or hold uh, well to 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 stabilize to give them some lumbar support. That's hung around the Jizo also and uh, given to the mother, the expecting expecting mother as a little gift from the Jizo. So. Um, that's nearby, well, about five minutes up, uh, nearby, well, just in front of the, the second house that just got sold to my friend. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, I'm really excited to see how I can make a cycling tour uh, that links uh, all these old uh, places. Actually, that, that place with the Jizo has a Kayabuki roof. You can see the thatch and uh, it's really nice. So um, there's the onsen, the hot spring. Oh, yeah, that's the Kayabuki roof of the Jizo-san. My, my house is like this too. And... Uh, link uh, the onsen with uh, this place, the Jizo, uh, the Jizo's place, and uh, also uh, something called the Okuhechi. So you may know that the key peninsula has something called the Kumano Kodo. There are various uh, pilgrimage trails, and Ryujin Village is actually the center of one of them. Uh, it's called the Okuhechi, which is uh, which just got um, the restoration just got completed in June, and they're launching it as a new trail in August. So um, that's something I want to explore, like how to. Uh, link the trail together with the onsen together with all this uh, traditional things you see plus the plants uh, in a single tour so that would be a cycling tour wow that sounds great on electric bikes because people are like oh mountains and bikes I, I can't do it but it's electric yeah that's a good idea um, I talked to a guide uh, who's doing a variety of things in Totori uh, and totori, he said yeah. the same thing that he likes to have the electric bikes and Michael? the regular bikes and then people can choose. Richard Pierce? Pierce, okay, I didn't meet uh, Richard, yeah. Not yet. You guys should connect, definitely. Uh, um, what other ideas do you have coming up? We've got 10 more minutes. Hmm. So I want to hear more about your plans for the guest house, the hmm. cafe, and the tours for the area. Hmm. So the reason why, why I need a cafe here is that uh, there, there's no place to eat here at night. So there is one uh, shokudo, a little, not a canteen, but a little restaurant uh, about 20 minutes down and they are open on, on up to about 8 o'clock. But there's nothing else to eat at night here. So if you're coming to stay uh, and my friend's uh, houses, they'll become guest houses. There will be nothing for people to eat at night here. Uh, plus in the daytime, um, if I want to have a cycling uh, tour thing, uh, it'll be easier for people to come to a cafe first, uh, meet up, because people might come at different times. It's quite rural. They might come by bus, by car. They can all meet in a cafe first, and afterwards we can go on our tour, or cycling tour, or hiking tours. And uh, as for the, the people staying here, there'll be food prepared for them. They can have breakfast here, lunch here, and dinner can be ordered. Like They can reserve it. So a cafe is really quite important for, for me to have a guest house business going on. So the cafe comes up first, uh, and that's going to serve locals also not just people staying over uh, and then the guest houses will come on um, and that's I'm expecting them to open next year my friends have to come over to decide how they want the renovations to be done renovate the houses get them registered licensed so that will be the whole of next year and uh, once I have both of them the tours do come in next uh, so uh, that will be the cycling tours that can happen at the same time as the cafe so let's see how it goes out um, but one of my dreams is to get a rickshaw tour here. Uh, so I might have mentioned this during the summit. The thing is, uh, rickshaw tours, they are popular in cities. <clears throat> and think, I think the highest altitude is at <clears throat> uh, Takayama. Uh, and that happened in the 1970s. They started having rickshaw tours. Kyoto also had rickshaw tours from the 1980s, I think. Uh, but it's all in on all in like uh, city areas. So there's no uh, rickshaw service in the mountains, but it so happens that this area is not too hilly. There are hills up and down mountains, but over in my area, it's, there's a plateau. So uh, I'm thinking of having a, a, a rickshaw service where I take people to the little waterfall, uh, the, the plants that are in season, the, far, the fields, and uh, it'll be a, like a half an hour tour. Uh, they learn about the nature here on the rickshaw. So that's um, something I'm saving up for. I love that idea because you would be able to retain the quiet, right? right. It's yes, not like a, a car or a moped with a loud engine. 
Right. It would and, be so beautiful. Nice idea. A lot of locals here, uh, they, uh, they, they can't get on bicycles because they're older. And let's say if uh, it's a couple, uh, o- uh, older couple, 70, 80 years old, and they come here with their kids, uh, well, the kids are all, all 50 years old. Uh, so they come in a car, but they want to explore the area and they can't explore it in a car because if you stop on the road in a car, it's like, you, you can't really stop. So uh, on the rickshaw, you can stop whenever, wherever you want. You can go on the sides, explore the smaller roads. So uh, that's something I think uh, would be really interesting for the village uh, because Ryuji Mura in the past never had good roads. So when rickshaws were popular in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, uh, there was never a rickshaw service here. Um, and uh, if there's a rickshaw service now, it'll be the first rickshaw ever in the mountains for this area. Um, I also, I want to point out your beautiful YouTube channel. And I, I think, I expect, I predict that you will be at 1,000 uh, subscribers <laughs> very soon. Because most of your videos gets over 3,000 views. Right. Um, you're doing so well. And the most popular one is making charcoal. Yeah. And then making your irori. But you have so much great information about the area and uh, doing your renovations, but also doing a beehive, uh, doing composting, all the different projects. Are you going to start adding your ideas for cycling tours and stuff there too? Right. Yeah, yeah, of course. So the YouTube channel it started off as a way to update my friends and family about what I'm doing here, uh, because in in the times of COVID, nobody can travel, so uh, they can't come here to see things in real life. I thought, oh, I'll have a camera from my documentary days, and uh, I didn't want to stop taking videos, so just record everything. And now it's become quite fun to watch uh, the the older videos, like the ones from a year ago, because I can see uh, what I was thinking about a year ago. It's quite different from what I'm doing right now. So uh, it's become a sort of a record for me. Uh, it's fun that way. Just I'm not I'm not thinking of like expanding it. It doesn't have to be a big channel. Uh, it's just a way to see how, how things go uh, with the farmhouse here. Yeah, it's a great way to document what you're doing and the process, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, We have just a few more minutes. Can you give people advice who are thinking about moving to the rural area? Uh, Mm -hmm. You've done such a great job. You found a great community and you're helping to brand, but also expand the community by bringing new people and friends in. Do you have any advice for people who are thinking, oh, maybe I'd like to move out to the rural areas? Hmm. I'd say visit first. So uh, visit the area for fun. Just go there in a car. Uh, most rural areas, you can't get there by, by bus. Uh, it's in, very inconvenient. So uh, if you're going some, com, coming somewhere rural like, like this, Ryuji Murag, come here in a car with friends, uh, stay at the onsen, and afterwards, uh, ask, ask around, is there, is there a place available for me to rent? Renting is easier than just buying because buying sometimes the houses are there, but they're not for sale unless they are for, for friends and relatives. So uh, rent first, uh, like what I, I do here, and afterwards you can buy. So uh, a lot of people think of buying the house and stuff. Um, I think the limitation here is that if the house is too far gone uh, to just move in, like I was able to move into this house uh, while the renovations are still going on because it was... It was still kind of livable, but some houses that have leaky roofs and all that, uh, then it will be a bit more difficult for you to rent first. So I'd say uh, try to rent, uh, but come to the, go to the village first, uh, go to the rural areas first, um, maybe go a few times, see if you like it, and then start exploring. So that's, that's my advice, I guess. Uh, just visit the place. <laughs> good, good advice. Um, uh, we're, uh, Tiffany is, is saying wonderful conversation. She enjoyed it. She loves your positivity and the way you consider your neighborhood and respect the area. That's lovely. Thanks, Tiffany. And, uh, Blonde Nomad says, uh, coming with a car, any recommendations in Japan for car rental? Oh, so yeah, car rentals. Car rentals are really expensive in Japan. So uh, I would say that the the most reliable would be Toyota Rent-A-Car, also the most expensive. If you rent a car for, let's say, two weeks, you can actually buy a new car here. So so borrow a car. If you don't live in Japan Japan yet, uh, try to find some friends here. Uh, organize a little trip that you can share a car with uh, 
um, if you have a friend in Japan who would lend you their car, uh, that would be best. Uh, so I'd say that if you move to Japan, but just buy a second-hand car. A second-hand car, a K car, like a small light car, uh, would cost a thousand to two thousand uh, dollars. It's cheaper than renting from Toyota Rent a Car. Would be that would be about two thousand dollars after a week. So uh, that's that's after you move to Japan. If you are just visiting Japan, if you live overseas, then I'm afraid you do have to use Toyota Rent a Car. <laughs> Or another rent a car company. Well, um, you. I, I don't. I don't work with Toyota, so it's yeah. just uh, any other Toyota company. Uh, it's it just that Toyota getting, has been very good to me. Yeah, it is yeah. getting a little easier, but I think because we haven't had many international visitors for a while, right. uh, things really didn't change for the last two years. So yeah. hopefully, once the borders open and people start coming in, hmm. we'll see a bit more progress, a bit easier. Uh, any final words of wisdom from you, Lee? Wisdom. <laughs> no. You you are doing so many amazing projects. I would send anybody to your YouTube channel. Anywhere else? Are you also on Instagram? Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok. Uh, I just thought the TikTok channel is full of docs uh, because people on TikToks TikTok like like docs. There's no dancing. I can't do any dancing. Uh, so there's Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, YouTube. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Wonderful. Come here. The, 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 the thing is, all, that, all that's online. The most important thing is uh, when you can come, please visit because Ryujin Onsen is 1,300 years old. Uh, the Onsen, the Ryokan there is 400 years old. Uh, a daimyo, a ruler actually lived there, like stayed there. Uh, and there's all this nature around. Uh, I'll be happy to take you on a cycling tour or at least a, a, a tour of my tea farm here. Uh, you can have tea and you can walk the dogs. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, you're, that's much better than just it online. You're also inviting volunteers, right? Right. Uh, not 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 now, not now per oh, se. No, but no. uh, when things reopen and uh, when when the cafe is more stable, uh, <laughs> vaccinated travelers welcome. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, that's to restore the uh, the houses here, and I'll I'll need help with volunteers, but not at this moment because it's all contractors at the moment. Septic yeah. tanks, volunteers can help with that. Uh, yeah. And you have a crowdfunding campaign? They're coming up soon. Not yet. I haven't coming launched soon. it. Okay, you know, so as... that'll be launched on the YouTube channel? The YouTube channel, on Facebook also. Because what's happening is that we're getting some subsidies from uh, the Tokyo government, but not for everything. They don't pay for uh, the dishes. They don't pay for... Uh, like They don't pay for a lot of things. So uh, I do need to start up a, a, a crowdfunding campaign soon. And uh, now that the tea is all made, I have to package the tea, get some of the, those rewards ready, uh, and then I'll launch it maybe in two weeks. Wonderful. Hoping all the best. And uh, once the crowdfunding is launched, I'll help you share it around. Okay, uh, make sure you. a lot of people see it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lee. Wonderful conversation. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great weekend. Take care.